A very warm welcome to the virtual Espacio Bertelsmann in Madrid. On the occasion of Germany's EU Council Presidency this year, we are organizing a series of virtual events, and I'm delighted that we're doing this together with two great partners, the German Embassy in Madrid and the Commission representation in Spain. My name is Katharina Gnad, and I'm from the German foundation Bertelsmann Stiftung. Under the title Juntos Relatando Europa, the series of events is dedicated to discussing different aspects of the future of the EU, together with policymakers and think tankers across Spain, Germany and Brussels. The first event was held in the summer on the EU's Green New Deal. Today, we will talk about Next Generation EU, an instrument for the European recovery in the face of the corona pandemic. COVID has hit all of Europe. But not all European countries are affected to the same degree and not at the same time. This poses, uh, poses a challenge for the stability of European economies and ultimately to the functioning of the single market. But it is also a test for your European solidarity and burden sharing among member states. At the same time, the pandemic accelerates existing processes of economic realignment between great global powers. And this also increases the need for the EU to bolster its external competitiveness and its, reaffirm its economic model on the global stage. In creating the instrument Next Generation EU in July of this year, EU leaders sent a strong message of their political willingness, backed by unprecedented financial resources, to tackle the economic and social effects of Corona. The EU institutions and member states are right now in the process of putting words into action, into laws and into concrete projects. Many challenges remain, some of which we will have the chance of discussing today. With this, I welcome you again on behalf of all the partners and I gladly hand over to Professor Federico Steinberg, Principal Investigator at the Elcano Royal Institute in Madrid, who will moderate the debate. Federico, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome everyone. As, uh, as uh, Katarina said, uh, we are having this very important and relevant discussion today about Next Generation EU, which is uh, a radical proposal on the way we are going to be financing, you know, recovery and the transformation of the European economy uh, after the pandemic, preparing it to increase uh, productivity, to increase growth potential, and to make sure we don't have increased divergences between the different uh, member states. So for this uh, discussion, we have uh, four fantastic panelists. Uh, I'm going to introduce them briefly and then start uh, the discussion. Uh, we have Claudia Dorvor, Secretary, State Secretary at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy of the Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, we have uh, Professor Marcel Fratzer, President of the German Institute for Economic Research in Berlin. Uh, we have Celine Gauer, Head of the Recovery and Resilience Task Force at the European Commission. And we have uh, Carlos San Basilio here with me in Madrid, who is uh, Secretary General of the Treasury and International Financing at the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation here in Spain. So I'm going to start because there's a lot of confusion around, you know, how next generation EU is going to work by asking Celine, uh, basically, if, if she can, you know, walk us through the different steps, the deadlines, the timing, what can we expect when the funds can be dispersed, and also uh, the governance issue. How is, is, is this going to be organized? And if there's any conflict uh, regarding this idea of, you know, conditionality or not, or how the funds are going to be dispersed to, to the countries. What can we expect for this? So thank you very much for, for your question and good morning to, to everyone. I'm very happy to have the, uh, the occasion to, to debate virtually with, uh, with you this, uh, this morning. The so Innovation Facility, uh, as, as you mentioned, is a very large facility of uh, 672 billion to finance reforms and investment in the EU economy. So support can be given in the form of, of grants and in the form of loans. For Spain, we are talking about more than, than 60 billion in the form of loans and uh, 80 billion in the form of, uh, of loans. To access the funding, member states have to draw up plans, uh, plans, setting out the reforms and the investments that they would like to undertake in the next uh, six years. 
these plans are very important because they they are the one ensuring the state on their reform agenda and on the investment agenda how will it work to access the funding since the 15th of october uh, of this year member states are submitting their draft plan already to the commission uh, and and we have a very uh, debate and, and dialogue with uh, with them to, to refine the, the the content of those of those plans. This phase of uh, informal dialogue will continue until the end of December. From the first of January next year, member states will be able to formally notify their plans, and then the Commission will have two months to take a position on those on, on those plans and to make hopefully a proposal to the Council for approving those plans. Then, in turn, the Council weeks to approve the plans. So if we are uh, working all very well and, and if everything goes very well, we see the first plans uh, approved uh, in the course of March. Then, within two months, the Commission will be able to make a, a prepayment of up to 10% of the uh, to the Member States as pre-financing payment. After that, uh, that pre-financing payment, and every six months, Member States will have the opportunity to ask for, for disbursement uh, if they have uh, achieved the different milestones and targets that they will have themselves uh, agreed uh, with, uh, with the Commission and with the Council to have in their, in their plans. So we are asking when can we spend? I think May, June uh, is, uh, is, should, uh, should, should be possible. Of the two important caveats that I have to make on this, on this timeline, that is a timeline based on the commission that have uh, made to the co-legislator and that proposal is still uh, being discussed uh, between the, the parliament and, and, uh, and, and a second caveat is that obviously any payment can only be made if the budget uh, for the for the next seven years is agreed by uh, by the council if the uh, if the decisions also is ratified by all 27 uh, national parliaments but if everyone works uh, really intensively on, the, on, on this, this uh, should be the, the relevant time frame. Thank you. Now let me move to uh, quite a different question, uh, which is the German position. And actually, uh, I'm going to ask Claudia uh, about this one in particular, because we've seen that uh, it, in a certain way, uh, next generation EU has been uh, possible because uh, Germany has shifted a little bit its position, particularly when we compare it to previous uh, uh, moments of turmoil in, in the European Monetary Union. Uh, so basically, could you tell us a little bit more uh, about, you know, uh, the, the reason behind this new German uh, attitude uh, towards uh, these elements for recovery? Yes, thank you very much, Federico, and hello to everybody, and uh, buenos dias a nuestros amigos españoles. Uh, es un gran placer uh, para mí de participar a, este, a esta conferencia. Um, espero que todos estén bien. Okay, to your question, continuing in English, of course. Um, well, uh, if you are alluding, Federico, to um, the question of, of, of solidarity uh, and questioning whether um, this is a shift in, in the German attitude, I, I can just tell you that uh, solidarity has always been uh, important to Germany. And uh, I think we have always shown solidarity, but maybe in a different way and maybe not everybody um, understood it in, in, in such a way. But now, of course, as uh, we have, uh, as also others uh, who spoke before me said, an unprecedented uh, situation in Europe, exceptional circumstances call for exceptional instruments. And in that respect, uh, uh, Germany uh, indeed accepted an instrument uh, like the uh, recovery uh, and resilience facility or the next generation instrument as a whole, um, which, however, is something uh, which is um, limited uh, not only in volume, but it's it's a big volume indeed, but limited in time. As uh, Celine said, until 26. Um, so we, we need to use that time, and Celine has uh, described very well how things work. Um, it is, and I have to underline that, not an unconditional uh, budget support, of course, but it is something which is 
uh, connected to the European semester, to the country-specific recommendations. And so in that respect, as Celine said, member countries are invited to present their roadmaps. Uh, but the Commission, of course, is going to examine whether all is in line with the European semester and the country-specific recommendations, because the intention is not just to, you know, um, spend the money, but to use this instrument um, uh, to, to also um, continue with structural reforms, um, to also uh, try and work on becoming more resilient, uh, becoming more com competitive, becoming more innovative and, and what have you. So um, I think altogether is, is something which is uh, demonstrating um, the will of solidarity, but at the same time a, a, a spirit of cooperation, which is something which is also the motto of our German Council uh, presidency, Together for Europe's Recovery. That's the title of uh, uh, our motto, and uh, we as the presidency have the intention to continue working in that spirit. And uh, in that respect, I hope, as Celine <laughs> said, all the caveats she presented on the question when the money will be available. We are working hard on uh, getting an agreement with the European Parliament on the trilogue of the MFF and including all uh, instruments of next generation. Um, and today the uh, negotiations, if I may call them like this, uh, will continue um, between our negotiator and European Parliament. So I hope uh, we can deliver in time um, until Christmas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now let me turn to, to Carlos for the specifics of how Spain is thinking about this uh, next generation EU. Uh, what is the current thinking in the Spanish administration, the reforms, the elements that you want to stress on your program? Yeah, thank you, Federico, and uh, uh, buenos dias and uh, good morning, guten tag, also from my side. Thank you very much for uh, inviting us uh, to, this, uh, to this event. Well, we see Next Generation EU as a major breakthrough, breakthrough for, uh, for the European Union. We think it is a, a, a very significant step towards a, a joint action. We saw a very good example yesterday with a very successful first issuance of, uh, of the program. And, 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 and we think it's very consistent with what, what, with what has, been, has been done over the last few months since the uh, pandemic started. We've seen a, a very clear and consistent action from uh, member state and from the institutions. For, for, for instance, on the escape clause, on uh, the revision of the uh, state aid, uh, state aid uh, legal framework, but also on the approval in a, a record time of, uh, of, of the programs for uh, by the ESM, by the Commission on, on Sure, a guarantee a package uh, by the EIB. All this was done in a matter of weeks, uh, not, not, even, not even two months, uh, which is uh, something that could, could have been perceived as inconceivable before this crisis. So, so we think that, uh, that next generation EU uh, follows this uh, trend of, uh, of joint action and uh, solidarity, as has, has, has been said by my predecessor. And, and within the next generation EU, there are different programs. Uh, one of them definitely that, 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 that really makes a, a clear impact, a clear change is, is the uh, uh, recovery and resilience uh, facility. Here, uh, Spain is gonna, gonna put all our efforts to make sure that uh, we deliver on, 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 on the two main objectives that we see in this program, in this facility for Spain, which is on one hand, help us uh, coping with the uh, economic em emergency. On the other side, uh, to put the Spanish track, the Spanish economy, sorry, in a more sustainable uh, growth, growth path uh, looking forward. So it's not just short-term action, it's, it's an action in these two, three years that will help us have a better economy in, in years to come. So here uh, we have already presented uh, the main uh, priorities of the program. It was done by Prime Minister a couple of weeks ago with the plan España Puede. There are four basic priorities of the plan, uh, which are green economy, digital economy, uh, cohesion, and building the gender gap. But below that, uh, for uh, general principles, general objectives, you have a whole series of, uh, of specific programs that have to deliver on, on, on the, on the two, main, two, two main objectives, which is uh, to put the Spanish economy on a, on a sustainable and inclusive uh, uh, growth, growth, growth uh, uh, path. And here, I, I just want to say something very, very briefly, uh, Federico. Uh, I think the combination of, of investment and, and reform is, is the right way to do it because the really it, it ensures that the impact of the, of, of the, of the plan is going to be a long-term impact. For instance, if we think of, about one of the projects that which is embedded in the whole program uh, from Spain, for instance, is 
uh, under the cohesion and, and the main priorities, we have one of the levers, which is a, a better education system. Under the better education system, we have a re full revision of our vocational tra training programs. And here we're talking both about investment and about uh, structural reform. So, 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 so we, I want to convey this message that, that we're looking at it uh, jointly from the point of view of how the plan can have an impact, a, a lasting impact in, 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 in our economy. We, we know there is, a, there is a lot of funds uh, coming and we want to make the best possible use of the funds for, uh, for Spain for years to come. Thank you. Yes, this is clearly essential because on the one hand, reforms are sometimes complicated because of uh, political economy constraints. But if you have funding, that would be you know, much easier to, to move forward. And the key is to make sure that we have a lot of investment in this period in which without these funds, probably public investment would, would have been more constrained and then private investment could also be uh, constrained and we would be less able to increase growth potential, which is what we all want. So uh, I'm going to, to shift now to, to Marcel and go for a more uh, macroeconomic question in a way. Uh, I would like to ask you, you know, what are your, your growth prospects for, for the European Union, for the Eurozone? Do you think, you know, uh, different speeds of the recovery or, you know, or are these radical uncertainty situations that we're facing, uh, you know, completely uh, blinding us? Uh, are you more or less optimistic, pessimistic on your, or your macroeconomic forecasts? Good morning, and uh, first of all, thank you for having me uh, join this discussion. Um, to your question, I, I also want to emphasize what, what the previous three speakers have been saying, that the next EU, uh, next generation EU, um, is a very important initiative for the transformation of the European economy. Uh, but your question, Frederico, is, is more about the short term, and um, indeed, uh, we have to be aware, and um, as uh, was described before, next generation EU, the money will flow over probably starting next year and then the years after. So um, we still have this big, big challenge now uh, in the short term over the next year. And most of our economies in Europe are um, in the middle of a second wave or the beginning of a second wave. And from, a, from an economic perspective, in terms of projections, um, our baseline projection is still that we will see uh, a gradual recovery next year, um, that we could have uh, could be back to pre-crisis levels in, in maybe early 2022. Um, yet what I want to emphasize is that the risks are enormous, um, the, that a second wave might hit European uh, economies, weaken them substantially. Um, I see in particular the risk from um, corporate insolvencies and unemployment. These I see as two major risks for the euro area economy, for the EU economy. Um, we have seen that global trade has been picking up now in the last few months, but also that we shouldn't take for granted. Um, we don't know how the impact on the financial system will be. So what I'm describing are different types of risks that each of them uh, could pull the Euro, the EU economy back into recession, so a contraction in subsequent quarters. Um, so I want to emphasize that we are far from being through the most severe um, period of the crisis in terms of health, but also in terms of the economic impact. Um, my big concern is that um, the impact is very different, very heterogeneous across EU economies. And sadly enough, what it seems to indicate now, the data for the past few weeks, is that the economies hit hardest by the first wave over the last half a year, March, April, May, are also very strongly affected now. Uh, so we might well see that uh, the north-south divide uh, in the European Union could widen. Uh, fortunately, so far, many of the central eastern European economies have done relatively well. We don't know that whether this will hold also now the second wave. But what I want to describe is the risks are enormous. Um, we don't really have many European instruments to deal with that. Yes, there is sure the, the uh, possibility to finance um, the, the furlough schemes for employment. Um, and there has been a very successful launch of the financing, first round of financing for that the last, the last few days. But my concern over the next year is that the uh, EU economy could be hit very hard, that um, we will mainly have to rely on domestic national policymakers, in particular fiscal policy, 
to continue acting in a decisive manner, uh, to continue do, doing so as they have done over the past half a year. Um, so I think we need to be aware that we are far from through this crisis. And maybe a very quick final point, we should be aware that what's happening now in terms of unemployment, in terms of corporate insolvencies could have long-term permanent negative impact on the uh, EU economy. And we really need to, uh, our policymakers need to act to minimize that permanent damage so that a smooth and hopefully quick recovery can be ensured. Thank you very much, uh, Marcel. Yes, absolutely. And the good news, if you want, is this, you know, the, the ECB has reacted very fast in, in being a, a backstop for the need to continue issuing uh, domestic uh, sovereign debt. But on the other hand, besides what you mentioned, we have uh, another risk, which is Brexit. We have another risk, which is what's going to come out of the American elections and the, the trade relationships between the European Union and the US. So yes, we, on top of all the complications, we have a, a new risk that we have to take into account. Let me go back to, to Celine, to the specifics of, of the recovery plan. And I would like to ask you directly about the climate-related uh, you know, spending and programs. 37% of all the expenditure under the, the recovery and resilience facility must be climate-related. And the idea is to foster the green transition. Uh, so in which areas do you expect the expenditure to happen and how would you, you know, want to keep track of, of that target? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, the, uh, the the Green Deal was uh, for us the uh, the, the growth uh, engine and, uh, and and the growth agenda of the EU before uh, the crisis uh, hit us, uh, and and we see that this is still the case today. And we also see that the of of, of action against uh, climate uh, global warming is is still and has not really decreased uh, from uh, with the crisis. So the target of 37% uh, uh, is uh, has been introduced in the uh, in, in in the plan by uh, the council that, that uh, agreed on it uh, already in uh, in July, and we see this as a, as a huge opportunity to ensure that the facility will be used to fill the significant investment gap that we that we have uh, to meet all 2050 targets. Uh, the obviously not to go back to where before the crisis, but to try and use this crisis as an opportunity to accelerate uh, the green and the digital, but, but here more particularly the green uh, transition of, uh, of our economy. In the recent communication that, uh, that, we have, uh, that we have published on the annual sustainable growth uh, strategy, uh, the Commission has defined a number of uh, flagship areas where uh, we see that investments are particularly uh, necessary. And three of those seven flagships uh, relate to uh, to the green uh, to the green target. The first one is renovation of uh, of building, uh, and we we see the renovation of building as uh, as a huge uh, potential uh, for decreasing our CO two emissions. As, as you as you know, they are responsible for uh, for a very very large share of, uh, of of the emissions. But they are also an opportunity to boost the economy because they are um, the works that are necessary to renovate the buildings are uh, very uh, work intensive or very labor intensive, and normally the type of uh, of, of companies that provide those works are uh, local SMEs uh, providing really jobs to uh, to lo a lot of our, of our workers. So we really see with this uh, renovation of, uh, of 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 buildings in a uh, flagship uh, an opportunity to combat and, and the need for recovery. Then the second area where we, we see uh, a lot of need for investment is sustainable mobility. This is necessary not only as, as a source of emission, but also to improve uh, the, uh, the, the quality of, of air, in particular in, in you know, cities, and to, uh, to protect the, um, the environment. And this is another area where a lot of investment uh, have to be, be made, a lot of investment cross-border, and, and, and a lot of in, uh, investment in, uh, in, in the, the cities and, and in the regions as well. And then finally, clean technologies and uh, and renewables. So we we know that all energy mix have to change uh, very significantly to to uh, become uh, carbon uh, neutral in uh, in, in twenty fifty. Uh, and and the production of electricity is one of the of, of the clear uh, of the, the obvious areas where investment have uh, have to go. So more renewables, also development of hydrogen, uh, not in isolation by each and every member state, but also in as uh, as cross border uh, initiatives. All of these areas will count uh, towards the, uh, the the green target, and to monitor the uh, this the compliance with that target, we will use the, uh, the 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 normal tool that we that we have for monitoring spending in the in the budget, uh, 
tailoring marker, but also beefed up uh, with, uh, with the work that is uh, that is ongoing uh, in, uh, in in Europe at, um, at at the moment. All of this is also direct commitment was uh, announced by uh, the president in a State of the Union speech, uh, explaining that uh, we will try to have 30% uh, of the of the spending uh, of the borrowing uh, uh, used for the for next generation EU uh, in the form of um, of green bonds. And then finally, and that's my my last point, uh, all of the spending in in the facilities, not only the study. 7% everything will have to comply with the do no significant harm uh, principle, ensuring that uh, everything is consistent uh, really with the green agenda. Thank you. Well, thank you, Celine. And it, this makes clear that, uh, you know, this, this uh, recovery fund uh, aims also at, at putting the European Union at the forefront of the fight against climate change. And there are other elements that have to do with the trade policy that will also contribute to this. So let's, let's hope that the EU can play a really crucial role in terms of leadership for, for this you know, global challenge we have. Uh, I would like now to, to, to go back to, uh, to Claudia and, and basically to, to ask her, uh, to ask you about the the, the issue of how we're going to be able to deal with uh, the large amount of debt that uh, you know all member states are going to be accumulating. Of course, uh, next generation EU is going to mean that there's going to be more debt at the European level and a little bit less debt at the domestic level. Uh, but you know, there's an ongoing discussion here about uh, you know the, the levels of debt to GDP are going to be high, and maybe uh, we were going to be needing a period of uh, very low interest rates for even longer than we. Expect. Expected. Uh, the Federal Reserve uh, in the U.S. has, uh, you know, already said that it's willing to accept a little bit higher inflation to be able to reduce the real value of debt in, in the coming years. Uh, the ECB is reviewing its monetary policy strategy as well. So, where where is uh, Germany in this in this debate? What is your current uh, thinking about how we're going to be able to to you know, deal with the debt burden going forward? Yes, thank you, Federico. Um, Yes, indeed. I mean, already in March, um, the, um, the Commission and, and we all practically have um, uh, put into uh, effect the, the general escape clause of the Stability and Growth Pact, and uh, this, this has been activated for the first time in our lifetime. And we think that with this, we have the necessary flexibility to take all the measures necessary uh, to cope with the crisis. Um, it is a possibility of a temporary deviation and um, while it is rather difficult, of course, to envisage um, how things will go on, Marcel has been describing the risks uh, in Europe um, and, and elsewhere and it is very difficult, of course, to, to see where we go from here. Uh, you have, um, Federico, you, you have mentioned uh, the ECB um, now examining their politics. Um, I, I have to admit that there is a general rule for the German government that we are not commenting on what the ECB is doing. So I will stick to that and I beg your pardon on that. But if I have another minute or so to go, I would, I would love to, to comment on two things uh, Marcel and Celine have uh, mentioned before because Marcel said um, he's a little bit um, afraid that maybe in member countries uh, the effect of the RRF uh, will be uh, will be different um, and uh, Celine pointed out which flagships uh, the European Commission has been putting forward. I would like to add a, a new angle on, on that saying that at least for the German Council Presidency but even before when we were just Germany as a member country it has been very important that we do something all together in Europe and uh, we have uh, put forward uh, already before the crisis some ideas on how to strengthen our strategic autonomy. Um, let me just name all those IPCI's important project of common European interest, for example, on uh, microelectronics, which was the first one, then the battery cell production, the second one, and now, as Celine has mentioned, hydrogen. Indeed, I mean, we are thinking about um, putting uh, forward uh, a hydrogen IPCI 
Um, and uh, to add another aspect um, on on data, uh, the uh, the idea of having a European cloud where European SMEs um, could uh, put their data into without risking um, that it would be spread around the whole globe uh, is also an idea uh, which Germany has put on the table, which has been supported by the President of the European Commission. Um, and I just uh, will, will let uh, the, the, the keyword uh, Gaia X uh, drop, um, because this is something where we think we could work all together. And if you just look at the um, the member countries who, for example, have uh, flagged their interest in the IPCI on battery cell production, I mean, there, there are a lot, and it's not just something which has been done by two or three member countries. So I think this is something we should keep in mind also for becoming uh, more uh, strategically autonomous in the next year and where we should prepare the ground right now. And it's also also some kind of a flagship where we can say, hey, we are Europeans, we're uh, all sticking together, we're working together, uh, and this is something where which could add on um, overcoming the crisis as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and don't worry at all. I'll, I'll re redirect the, the, the monetary policy question to Marcel in a minute. And I would like to emphasize that what you just said about strategic autonomy is crucial. We are going towards a, a very complicated geopolitical landscape and we need, you know, economic sovereignty, technological uh, sovereignty and autonomy. And actually, next generation EU opens the door for, you know, somehow a new uh, thinking around the international role of the euro, which is also part of this strategic autonomy. But let let me uh, go back to, to Carlos and, and, and the Spanish debate uh, a little bit more. Uh, in, in the case of Spain, uh, there's uh, some discussion currently about the capacity to absorb so, so many funds in such a short period of time. Uh, and also a discussion around, you know, the different elements that you just explained that are on the table. Uh, Spain has uh, already uh, applied for the SURE funding. Uh, uh, we have Next Generation EU, but uh, we're talking about the, the, the transfer part, not, re not yet the, the loans part. So if you could, uh, you know, tell us a little bit what is the current thinking about, you know, absorption capacity and also what instruments are we going to, to use? Sure, Federico. Uh, just before uh, getting into this question, I, I want to highlight what, what my predecessor just said, which is the, the important to bring this uh, regional and even sub-regional angle to the, to, the, to, the, to the whole facility. So it's, uh, we shouldn't be just looking at, the, at what each country can do on its own, with its own plan and its, in its own uh, uh, specific e economy. We think that the plan can have uh, uh, also uh, synergies and and, and, and even a multiplier effect if, if, we, if we try to undertake some uh, regional projects uh, along the lines that have been mentioned, the cloud and, and uh, batteries and so on. And not only pan-European, but also uh, uh, sub-regional projects uh, uh, would make a lot of sense and we should be working in, in, this, in this sense. Then on, on the absorption capacity, it is, it is clearly a big challenge and we, we know that. Uh, so we are considering uh, that uh, we expect basically to receive uh, next year somewhere around 25 billion euros. And, and we are already considering that we're going to have this in our, in our, in our own budget and we will be spending them according to the uh, principles of the, of the plans approved by the, by the Commission, hopefully, uh, beginning of this year. Uh, the absorption capacity has uh, challenges on both fronts, on, on, on the domestic and on the European level. On, on the European level, it's very important that, that, that we put in place a system that, which is uh, effective and, 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 and where the decision-making process is, is smooth where, for instance, is not only the, the time we spend in the approval of the plans, but also uh, subsequent discussions on, on, on disbursements. They should be done uh, smoothly with the necessary controls, of course, uh, but quickly to ensure uh, delivery uh, 2021, 2022, and 2023. But it is very important that we get a, a significant part of the, of, of the funds already uh, uh, next year because uh, we're going to need them uh, to put our economies back, uh, back, back on track. And, and here we are working with the Commission, with the institutions, and we rely on the capacity of, of, of our German friends as a presidency to, 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 re to reach a good agreement uh, uh, with the Parliament in the trilogues and the Commission. But we're also working uh, here at home. Uh, we are working 
on, on some legal uh, amendments to the whole framework for procurement. So, so we are working on a royal decree law that will make sure that we avoid some bottlenecks in the procedure for approving uh, the plans and, and the projects, I'm sorry, and then interacting with the Commission uh, with all the certification uh, process that is going to be necessary. And I have to say that we, we, we are leveraging already on some work that had been done in previous months and even last year, which is the identification of specific uh, projects and plans that, that meet the requirements of the plans and the top priorities that I mentioned before. Thank you very much. And now uh, let me go back to, to uh, uh, Marcel on, on this question of, of debt and monetary policy. I, I know you've been working on, on these topics uh, for a while, and these are very much connected to what we said before about the, the macroeconomic scenario. But I would like to ask you about your, your current thinking on this issue of uh, uh, are we going towards a world with uh, more inflation because of all the stimulus, uh, with uh, less inflation or even deflation because of the recessionary elements and the, the, the lack of confidence that can undermine consumption and investment? And uh, more, more specifically on, on the exit strategy uh, for dealing with these huge amounts of debt and with these uh, you know, internal discussions, uh, not at the ECB, but in general in, in Europe about uh, you know, the future of monetary policy. I would like you to reflect on that. Thank you. Yeah, let me start with, with monetary policy and, and the ECB. Um, now, the ECB has acted very decisively with the PEP program, with the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, has provided a lot of liquidity. And if you look at spreads uh, in financial markets, you see that this has been largely successful. Now, um, the main challenge I see is one of deflation and not inflation over the next two, three years. This crisis in economic terms is more is a demand-driven crisis than a supply-driven crisis. And I think this is now becoming quite clear. In the first phase of the crisis, we were worried about supply chains being interrupted. So mainly the crisis being on the supply side. But we realize um, the key problem we have in Europe at the moment and globally as well is that corporate investment is very low and also consumption, private consumption has been going down. So the challenge for the ECB will be more one of deflation than of inflation. We see this already in the, in the numbers, um, that inflation numbers have been going down, partly in deflationary territory. So this will be the key challenge. Um, now. It's very important to emphasize that the European Central Bank alone uh, cannot tackle this crisis, cannot make sure that it meets its inflation, its price stability objective. This is only possible if fiscal policy supports monetary policy. And uh, again, over the last six months, I think fiscal policy has been doing a very good job. It needs to continue doing so over the next year. So fiscal policy at the national level needs to support the recovery. Uh, and avoid um, uh, worse outcome in terms of the risks that we described. Now, the issue of debt um, is one that clearly is of big concern. We have seen a sharp increase in private and public debt. Um, the rise in corporate debt is quite clear. Many companies are over indebted. I mentioned early on the risk of uh, corporate insolvencies, but also public debt has increased sharply. Um, in countries like Italy, uh, to probably more than 150, 155 percent of um, debt, public debt or GDP, um, but in every other country as well. Um, now, I think I am, from an economic perspective, not so concerned about this um, because um, we see that financing conditions remain very favorable. Um, and governments have been doing a very good job in terms of fiscal policy. So there's a high degree of confidence and trust in the fiscal policy and the debt path of um, also of Italy. And this is reflected in the relatively low levels of interest rates and the relatively low spreads. I think this is very important to emphasize. So my concern over the next five to six years is not about the magnitude of public debt, um, my main concern is the question, how do we generate enough growth uh, in the European Union that will allow governments to reduce public debt over the long term? Uh, that is the single most important instrument, also historically, to reduce both public debt and private debt. Uh, and the alternative, high inflation, so in a way um, to deflate, uh, to inflate away uh, public and private debt, I think is 
is not a very good strategy. Uh, it's a better strategy than, than uh, cutting public investment for sure. I think we need to have, we must have learned from the European crisis 10 years ago that many governments cut too much on public investment, thereby reduced productivity, um, hindered a stronger economic recovery. So for me, one important lesson of the global financial crisis and the subsequent European crisis is that governments need to be expansionary in fiscal policy, but very importantly to do that in investment that supports productivity and economic growth. This is the most effective and the, the best path to both uh, generate jobs, uh, employment, um, growth, and at the same time reducing public debt in the long run. Thank you very much. So uh, I absolutely agree that the key element is to increase uh, growth potential and, and the best way to pay back the debt is, is through an increase in the, in the denominator of this debt to GDP ratio. And therefore, uh, let's hope that the funds are going to be you know, useful for increasing productivity. Uh, I start with my last uh, round of questions and, and go to, to Celine again. Uh, basically, I would like to ask you about the, the way you're dealing with, with this uh, whole program at the European Commission. I, I know if you you have, uh, you know, reconfigurated somehow the internal mechanisms uh, that you have different, you know, groups of people and teams following the different countries. So are you going to, you know, look at the recovery programs uh, all together? Are you going to have a, a discussion, a comparison? Uh, how are you structuring all, all these uh, elements uh, internally? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I think the the, uh, the recovery and resilience gives us opportunity to uh, to transform the, the the economy, and it's going much much beyond the traditional uh, European semester, which is a framework for for for, for the facility, uh, and which traditionally focused more on macroeconomic and social policy uh, only. So here we really have the entire European agenda, the tool to implement it both in terms of reforms and in terms of, uh, of investment. So to try and, and, and have effective structure uh, for, for the implementation of that facility, uh, the Commission has set up a, a dedicated task force, um, uh, which, which indeed I'm, uh, I'm, I'm heading, uh, and, uh, and that task force is organized uh, in, uh, in, in a matrix, so both with uh, country uh, teams that are responsible for engaging and, and to stay in the development of their uh, of their plans and 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 thereafter in the implementation of their uh, of their plans and also by a thematic component uh, for the different elements uh, of the plans like uh, the green uh, elements for, uh, or uh, the social uh, component of the plan uh, or the digital uh, aspects uh, to be to be covered and that matrix organization should allow us uh, to also ensure uh, perfect consistency across uh, the plans uh, of the of the member states. Obviously, the plans will be different because every member state has specific challenges uh, and also country specific recommendations that have to be to be addressed. But it is really important that the same type of issue and the same type of, of challenges uh, are addressed in a, in a consistent uh, manner. The organization of the task force is also quite quite important together with the colleagues uh, of the uh, economic uh, department of the commission to, to all the policy uh, DGs, so the, the, the sectoral uh, departments in charge of climate, in charge of, uh, of, uh, of social or even uh, digital or, or, or culture, uh, are linked into this work and can contribute their specific expertise uh, to support the member states and uh, and and to, uh, to to review the um, to review the plans. Uh, this is also important, and I and I'll stop there to ensure the consistency of the funding because, uh, as as you know, the, the 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 funding of the plans come in addition to the cohesion funding, but also to the instrument uh, for for. Um, for the digital program or for the transport uh, program. So we have to ensure that all of these different fundings are used in the most effective and, and more complementary way uh, uh, by, the, by, by the member states. And this, uh, this coordination function that we also have in that respect uh, should, be, uh, should be helpful. So we are in uh, the tenth phase of discussion with, uh, with the member states, and I hope that uh, this will allow us to support them effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. And going specifically again to, to Claudia and to the 
the, the thinking in Germany about the, the proposals and, and the recovery program and the structural reforms you are going to put on the table, you already mentioned some elements that are crucial, but I would like to ask you to give us a little more detail on well, what are the reforms that you, you think Germany needs to face uh, the economy of the 21st century? Yes, thank you, Federico. Um, first of all, I must say, I think Spain is, is uh, ahead of, of Germany in presenting the plan because we are still uh, working on it. Um, but one thing has already been clear right from the beginning for Germany, namely um, to practically um, echo uh, our national decisions um, on the stimulus package um, with uh, the RRF, uh, RRF uh, project, which means that um, with our national stimulus package, we already um, have foreseen um, to um, promote specifically climate neutral politics. Uh, Celine has mentioned um, e-mobility. Indeed, this is one of the sectors we have been including in our national stimulus. Uh, package uh, and the same uh, goes for uh, digital uh, transformation. So um, we we have decided, in general terms, that most of uh, what uh, will be the amount for Germany on the recovery and resilience facility will be dedicated to the stimulus uh, package uh, content. Um, there are some exceptions, uh, but. Uh, uh, this is this is the general rule, and here we we are working on that, um, and uh, I hope we will be ready soon. Thank you very much. Uh, and now uh, going back to to Carlos. Uh, Again, around this discussion about the, the debt to GDP ratios and the sustainability, um, how do you envisage you know, the way we can stabilize, in the case of Spain, the debt to GDP ratio? Uh, are you concerned about this? Uh, what, what are your, your, your current things? Yeah, uh, uh, again, uh, Federico, uh, uh, let me take advantage of what uh, Claudia and Celine just mentioned to, to make a brief uh, remark about where we are with our own plan here in Spain and, and then uh, move to the debt to GDP ratio. And uh, not that I want to avoid it. <laughs> It is, uh, it is indeed, it's clear that we have presented the España Puede plan, which uh, sets the priorities of, of the plan. But what we're working now on is, is the very detailed plan uh, that has to be submitted to the Commission according to the guidelines that were uh, uh, released a, a few weeks ago. This is a major task because, uh, uh, because we have to go very much into the details of, of, of each and every uh, project uh, with uh, with the flagships, with the, uh, with the benchmarks, with the reforms and investments. So, so it's, it's very detailed. We, we, we've made a lot of progress, as I said before, and we're planning to submit the first uh, a broad a draft uh, already this week uh, or early next week to the Commission. Uh, we've been exchanging views with Celine and her team in recent, in recent weeks. Uh, but we will keep on submitting uh, uh, subsequent uh, patches of documents as, 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 as we uh, have them ready, as the Commission have asked that to not to wait until the very last minute and, and to have a, a, a continuous uh, interactive dialogue. So, so we are already engaged in this, in this process, which is uh, very ambitious and challenging for both sides, from our side and definitely at the Commission, at the commission, commission level. The to GDP ratio, it's clear that we are also going to see a, a, a big, a sharp increase here in Spain this year, which is, a, which, which is a, a sad. I've been in the Treasury for several years already, and, and one of our biggest efforts in recent years have been to bring the debt-to-GDP debt ratio down. Uh, we picked uh, slightly above 100% of GDP uh, in the peak of the crisis. Uh, it has been going down. It was close to 95% uh, uh, last year, and now we're going to bring it up again this year. Uh, so somewhere around 118% uh, along these lines. That's what we expect for, for this year. And, and again, uh, subject to the, to the uncertainty around the economic situation, we expect it to peak at this level and, and, and even uh, next year uh, go down a little bit uh, uh, marginally uh, because the uh, nominal growth will compensate still a, a high deficit. And definitely we expect uh, to, to see it going uh, on a downward trend uh, uh, more clearly starting in 2022. So, so we, we, we think that the conditions are good for funding the treasuries uh, around Europe. We, we, I shared the views uh, previously exp uh, exposed. We don't see it as a, as a, as a, as a big threat at this stage. Uh, 
But uh, we have to look uh, at it carefully uh, with a medium and long-term perspective. And also we have to look at other risks uh, around the economy, uh, not only in terms of uh, uh, public debt, but also the uh, situation in the corporate sector, which is, as has been mentioned before, a, a very difficult one and w that will need a very careful analysis and, 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 and strategy from our side as well. Thank you. And on that point you made before, it's, it's clearly a very, a very important element to make sure that you know, the, the plans are, are fast and the, the negotiations with the Commission are relatively smooth, so, so the disbursement of the money and the funds can, can come precisely at the moment when we need them most and not when, when we are you know, getting out of the, of the bad situation. So uh, going to, to myself finally on, 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 on my last question uh, before we have this commitment to, to finish in an hour before 12 o'clock, uh, I want to ask you, you know, another more technical macroeconomic question about uh, productivity, the multiplier effects of this plan, and, and where is your, your, your view here? In the last years, there's been this kind of puzzle amongst economists. You know, we have a lot of investments and, and revolutions in technology, but we don't see productivity increase. You mentioned before that uh, investment is key for productivity increases. So do you think that these funds could have a large multiplier, uh, bring in private sector money, and more importantly, do you think that we're going to be able to increase uh, productivity substantially due to these plans? Thank you. Two general points to, uh, to, to, to answers to your question, Frederico. One is, I think what's really important, we cannot emphasize enough, it, is how important convergence is within the European Union. The EU as a single market, the, the euro as a common currency can function only if there is a convergence process. So the next generation EU is clearly designed also to contribute to that. Second point, um, and I think I, of course, echo what um, everyone else has been saying, um, the next generation EU uh, funding is very crucial to improve productivity. It's really about uh, enabling, supporting structural change. The very strong focus on, um, on climate protection, environment, uh, with a very important focus on the digitalization, on structural transformation of our EU economy. Um, so I think I would describe next generation EU as a necessary but not sufficient element. And um, I don't want to repeat all the positive points that have been said. I just want to emphasize that national policymakers also need to do their part now to use the funding in a wise way so that it doesn't substitute existing domestic funds, but really complements them, so that it's really a truly additional component. Uh, second, it needs to be complemented at the national level, as well as at the European level, with uh, other structural reforms, making institutions more efficient, um, uh, improving regulation. Uh, that also means completing the single market for services. It means um, having a capital market union, so also uh, on that side. So there are many other elements we need to consider in conjunction with the next generation EU uh, component. Um, so again, it's necessary but not sufficient. Uh, if not other steps at the European level in terms of regulation, in terms of completing the single market, and also national policy reforms are implemented in conjunction, uh, we must realize that the next generation EU will not be effective, not as effective as it could. Um, so this is important for me to emphasize, and that gets to your question, Frederico, about multipliers. So um, I see this as a huge opportunity also uh, to understand the pandemic as a wake-up call uh, to speed up that stru structural transformation. We must realize that important, that in many important areas, economic areas, such as digitalization, information, communication technologies, Europe is lagging behind. Uh, the US uh, and parts of Asia, China, Korea, Japan. Uh, so we really need to speed up that process. Um, so I want to be optimistic. I think this, uh, everyone has understood how important uh, that transformation process is. Um, but for me, in a nutshell, really the key point is we, we need to take next generation EU as the first impetus, um, but um, it needs to be uh, followed by other uh, reforms, other additional steps, both at the European and the national level. 
Thank you very much, uh, Marcel. And you've all been very disciplined. We are right on track for uh, my final remarks. I'm going to ask you if, if anybody wants to react or has some, something that didn't say. Uh, or I, I, I had the Brexit risk or, or on my notes as well. We didn't touch on that. But you know, the good news is that, in a way, uh, you know, we still have like a month to get to a deal, that's complicated. Uh, but on the other hand, Brexit is not the key element of our discussions, and, and we, are, I think, are, are very clear about that. So any final reactions? Or, or if not, I will wrap up with, with some of the conclusions. Mm. Not from my side. Celine, no? Claudia? OK, so uh, basically, I, I, I will not attempt to, to you know, summarize all you have said, but I, I think there are two or three important takeaways. Uh, from this discussion. The first one, I think, is that uh, Europe is clearly part of the solution. And I think this is, it has to be re-emphasized because I remember in March, uh, at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, um, before the Eurogroup agreement that Carlos mentioned, uh, there was a discussion, you know, Europe is not reacting fast. And uh, now it's very clear that uh, uh, both in the, in the side of the monetary policy, the fiscal reaction, and also the institutional uh, step forwards uh, that are embedded in Next Generation EU, uh, Europe is, is part of the solution and all member states uh, understand the usefulness of, of Europe in a moment when there was some skepticism in some countries around the, the, the European integration process. Second, I would say that you know, we have a, a huge task uh, ahead of us. Uh, I think the Commission is very well prepared, and, and thank you, Celine, for giving us also the details of, of the restructuring, the process, the, the details. There's a lot of confusion I, I see on the Spanish debate. I guess it's the same in other countries uh, as to, you know, exactly when the funds are coming, what is the process. I think it's useful to explain to, to, to citizens how it works and what, what we, can we expect, and also to emphasize that this is about structural transformation of, of the economies and prepare them for the 21st century challenges, digital, uh, green, inclusion, etc. Right, And uh, the last element I would like to point out, which came, came about and I think it was uh, important, is that there's a risk uh, that has to do with uh, corporate debt. We already have identified part of the risk that are identifiable, uh, you know, like the issue of Brexit or the trade war or even the extension of the pandemic. But it's important to keep in mind that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's crucial to, to make sure that the financial sector, the banking system that, you know, was part of the problem, if you want, uh, in the 2008-09 crisis and now is part of the solution, keeps us being part of the solution. And for that, you know, we have to be alert and, and aware of, of, of the problems of the sector. Uh, and finally, uh, a last point, which is that uh, debt to GDP ratios are going to go up. But I think we are in a, in a moment in which, you know, this is, is manageable and there are a number of issues. Uh, we're going to be needing to think about the trajectory of, of debt uh, down the road. But at this point, we have to focus on, on doing whatever is necessary to make sure that growth potential is increased and that there are no scars on the long run in terms of unemployment or, or insolvencies of, of small and medium enterprises that can you know, hinder future economic growth. So uh, on that note, I would last, like to remind you that we're going to have another event organized by uh, Bettelsmann that's going to be on November 6 on Social Europe at 1.30. So I invite you all to join as well. And thank you very much to, to, the, to the German presidency, uh, to, to the Bettelsmann uh, Foundation, to the European Commission, and to the four speakers. I think this was really uh, very useful. Lots of questions around the table that were answered, some uncertainties that remain. Uh, but I hope that uh, this was useful for our audience and I would like to thank you very much. See you next time.